Hello, my friends. Good evening to you. Hope you all are doing great. Today is a very special evening. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming a very special guest. This is here, right here, is Marlene Bam joining us from France. And she's a very popular, esteemed poetess. She has over 12 collections several books of translations and she will be talking about all of those and many more other things including festivals in france which is just back from so why do we not extend a warm warm very hearty welcome to ma'am thank you so much for taking time out Thank you so much to you, dear Pankari. I'm very much honored and pleased to talk with you and uh, to share whatever you want to, to know about France and uh, French poetry. I'm really glad to be there tonight. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure and honor. I've also, we've also had the honor of, you know, uh, indulging in some translation projects and we will get to it later. Before, right there, starting with the festivals, you know, I've been actually following them on your Facebook page. And I'm going to try pronouncing the names of the festivals. And please tell me if I'm doing it right. Uh, uh, the Nantua Book Fair. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and then there is a, there is a, a Way and Poesy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, tell us all about it, you know, because we, we just don't know, so many of us don't know anything about, you know, uh, any of these events and festivals, and we would love to. Okay. So. Well, the festival you mentioned is a um, new one, uh, which, um, well, not the festival itself, the book festival existed in Nantua, which is a small town north of Lyon. Uh, in the east of France, near the border with uh, Switzerland. And um, at this uh, book festival has been uh, joined a um, poetry festival with uh, the um, association of a prize, a book prize for, for poetry. And um, well, it was a very nice occasion because I met readers. This prize is um, attributed by readers who had chosen uh, passes to read from the books they received from publishers and uh, they decided which was really uh, beloved by everybody in the in the Kayon poesie so i was very much honored to have my last book chosen by them um, it's not the only small poetry manifestation that uh, tries to emerge uh, recently uh, I'm surprised at that fact that uh, the recession, the economical recession and the pandemics uh, uh, doesn't seem to have influence on this uh, uh, tent tentative to promote poetry. Uh, big events have been um, abandoned. The poetry market in Paris couldn't uh, be um it good it couldn't well <laughs> sorry i'm i'm tired i can't find the words uh, there was no poetry market in paris last year and it has been postponed until october uh, this year uh, but uh, small poetry sites uh, still resist and uh, well uh, the second the one which seems important to me the second one i'm going to is uh, Voix Vive de Méditerranée, Vivid Voices of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's a big festival, um, which is in, set in the south of France, on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it has uh, been, uh, well, it has its first time, it has been for the first time in 2012, 2012. So it's uh, nearly 10 years. Uh, and um, for nine days, many poets and artists from all over the Mediterranean, um, but Africa, the Balkans, and even uh, people, Latin people exported in the South America, Central America, etc. So these, all these people are um, together for nine days and um, 
it's very interesting because it's in the center of the town, in the old town, and every street is a spot for meeting, for shows, for readings. It's a, it's a wonderful moment and a wonderful time. There are more, well, there are nearly 700 poets and uh, poetic uh, encounters and readings and shows, uh, street shows too. And besides, there are lots of um, publishers who are established in the central place of the town and you can discuss books, buy books, which is important for poetry too, and uh, eventually propose your own poetry. So, well, that's the next I'm going to, uh, where I will participate with uh, readings and musical performances. And uh, with a publisher friend, uh, we organize private evening readings too, as an off festival in a nice uh, spot, uh, an apartment we rent, where we have a patio, an internal courtyard, where we have readers and poetry and music. That's what I wanted to say about Wonderful. these two festivals. Right, and uh, what a gorgeous picture you have painted, very inspiring, and it's really nice to know that things are back in France, you know, beating the pandemic. And as it is, you know, it's the center of art and culture, so we think. So wonderful. Thank you, ma'am. I also wish to ask you about, can you hear me okay? No, not really. Are you being able? Oh, okay. Can you hear okay. me now? Yes, yes, quite well. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, uh, my signal is playing its uh, tantrum. Yes. Uh, I see. The internet signal. Yes. Never, yeah. <laughs> so um, what I was saying is that uh, you know it has always been the seat of art and culture, such a such an inspiration for us. And uh, uh, the next question that I want to ask is about this other festival that you've been to. You told us about one that you're going to, uh, you know, in this uh, Mediterranean festival, and uh, that is going to be great as well. But uh, you were in this other festival, Valbon Poetry Festival. Am I saying that right? Yes, you said it all right. But uh, the Valbon Festival was the first time too. And uh, <laughs> I hope it's not a one shot because uh, it was quite difficult uh, being postponed in summer when people are not there anymore and uh, being um, competed by the Cannes Cinema Festival. Which, is, which has been postponed too, so that I can't say more about Valbonne. But there are lots of other festivals in the yeah. south of France, in the center, in, uh, in Brittany, in Bretagne. Um, it's a very living, very vivid uh, activity in summer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, great, because I saw wonderful reading pictures from that event as well. So am I uh, audible? Is that, uh, or am I there or am I not? No, no, you, you're audible. You're audible. I, if you remain near the, um, the screen, I, I hear very well. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, the question that I've been dying to ask about your poetry books, 12 of them. You know, I'm just starting to translate a few of your poems and I'm really going gaga, very deep, intense poems. So tell us about your books, you know, um, the themes, expressions, your experiments with form, with content, and, you know, the style of writing. How did it uh, develop from the first one uh, to the latest one? Well, the first one has been very long to be born. This is it, uh, Phidias' last right. work. Uh, I've been writing it for 10 years, I think, and um, I think of publishing it late. And it wasn't very easy because uh, Phidias is a well-known artist of the classical Greece, but um, not really known actually by people, not intellectual. Uh, he has been so well known that um, it's been spoken of for centuries, even if his works have disappeared. Of him remain only um, a phrase 
with horses on the Parthenon and uh, in uh, in London. And I wondered uh, how somebody, how an artist with such uh, uh, popularity can be completely, uh, can have disappeared completely. And what happened to his works? Uh, uh, what we know too is that he was exiled at the end of his life for political reasons from Athens. And uh, I imagine he was living in an island, exiled in an island, and trying to get to the core of the marble he was working with, uh, trying to express the energy of this marble and giving it uh, its uh, divine uh, form. And it was, in my imagination, collegated to the pebbles I collected when I was a child. And uh, some of them were so beautifully white and uh, so beautifully polished. I just wondered if they couldn't have been some hard work in the past, centuries ago. So I just wrote this poem, which is, which is a long poem, a narrative form of poetry. And at that time, I didn't think of a theme in particular, uh, particularly, I was just uh, interested in what happened to people and to artworks. And when I published the second one, I just began to think that I had a theme, because the second one, which is this one, wonderful, Chilida's Ring, uh, is about another sculptor. Uh, Chilida is a contemporary uh, Spanish sculptor, uh, which uh, works are monumental iron sculptures. Uh, and um, they have suggestive names such as um, uh, wind calm, for example. And just, they just um, play with the wind, just as arts. And I, <laughs> I dreamed about it and imagine I had myself in my imaginary museum one of these artworks, but an imaginary one, which was in my mind something like um, Merbius ribbon, you know, this ribbon which has no beginning, no end, no face. Uh, it just turns over and over and over and you never see the, the, the reverse side of it. And I imagined you could just tap on this uh, sculpture and walk and visit the past and memory and your own memory, but also all the memories because it didn't, it doesn't have beginning or end. So you just travel through facts, through history, through memories, through people and myths. And that's when I began to realize that uh, I was interested in, in the memory, in my memory and in the universal memory. And that was, <laughs> that became evident when I published a third book with another publisher too. And this is very dear to me because the publisher allowed me to publish it in French and then bilingual with my Italian version of it. It's important to me because I am very much uh, attached to Italy, to the north of Italy particularly, because I lived in Palm, which is the town of Stendhal, for example. And uh, well, this book is called Vivid Memories of the Falls. And uh, I just wrote it thinking about the pictures I was taking. I shot a lot of uh, pictures from foals in nature, uh, foals in um, rocks, uh, foals on trees, and um, in um, textiles too. I just loved having details of foals. And I was rereading because it's a um, philosopher I read very much uh, because it makes me dream. I was reading uh, Gilles Deleuze, uh, who wrote a book about uh, the fold and Baroque art and philosophy. And in this book, there's a sentence which says that the fold is always between other folds, between the organic and the non-organic, between the living and the dead, between the animal and uh, the reasonable. And I just thought it was about memory, which is like uh, what <laughs> what we call, when we are greedy, we call the milfoil. This is a pastry where you have to uh, 
put the paste over and just turn it again and turn it again so that you have a succession of foils with paste. But when, when it is cooked, you can't say which foil is which. It's all right. a cake. And right. still the foils are there. And to me, I think the memory is just the same. You have your own memory from things you lived, you heard, you learned, things you were told of, and you are the memories of others too, through myths, through the memories, the universal memories. So I just wrote this uh, collection uh, with this idea that we are the memory of the universe and we are the mere foil of the memory of the universe. And then, uh, well, uh, I began to really think if I had a thematic and um, a way of writing which is peculiar to me because I write both in French and in Italian. And before this book, I didn't have the opportunity of um, putting them together. But uh, it has been very important to me. Some books have been written first in Italy when I was there and in Italian. And when I was back in France, I just couldn't go on with Italian. So I wrote in French, but I couldn't write the exact translation of the, the Italian version so that I sometimes had two uh, twin, uh, not real twins, <laughs> half twins with uh, differences. And that's what happened with the poem you're translating, Rooflet, which is quite different in the French version and in the English because I wrote it in English this time and not translated it into English. And, and that's where I learned how much interesting to me was translating. It's a way to mature things, think more about it and go further in the writing. And uh, well, uh, that's um, anyhow uh, different things when I wrote the next book, which has the same publisher. The next book, which got the prize in uh, Nantua at the K, the poesy, is The Drowned Woman of Onagawa. I have problems with putting it in center. The Drowned Woman in, of Onagawa is a seminar narrative poetry book too, just as Phidias. But this time, I have been uh, um, inspired by something I heard at the radio when I was getting up to go to work. Uh, at that time I was teaching and I took a train very early in the morning and I listened to the radio to have my timing. And the radio said that um, a Japanese husband had tried for three years to learn uh, diving because he wanted to find back the, the body of his wife who was been uh, taken away by the tsunami successive to the Fukushima disaster. And three years later, he just was still trying to find her back. And I had that that morning and it was an illumination. I just said, well, this is true. Myths are real and actual. This is Orfeo trying to find back a redis. It's not a myth, it's reality. This is love trying to go to hell, watery hell in this case, but going to hell to take back the beloved one. And so I wrote uh, this, um, this book, just as I wrote the next one, which is just, just, just out of the press, and it's called Son Corps d'Ombre. Uh, it's difficult to translate it. It's a beautiful book because I had the, the opportunity to make it with a friend which makes a collage. And uh, it, it was really a beautiful experience. Son corps d'ombre, I can't translate it because in French you can't make the difference between his or her. It should be his shadow body or her shadow body. And I was uh, very much uh, happy to have this opportunity in French because uh, this is, again, the story of uh, Orfeo trying to communicate with his wife, Eurydice. But it was written when I was mourning my own husband. So I was the one who was searching for the beloved who disappeared. So it was all the way 
it was the same thing, but <laughs> the other way around. And uh, well, this is another theme, I think. I love myths. I think myths are acting us and we make them actual and living. And poetry is the best way to transmit it to people, to make people understand that their lives is much, much greater, deeper than what uh, the, the society makes us believe it is. Yes. Then, well, there are other books. There are my translations, of course, but uh, so many I just found by this one to explain why I love uh, translating, but maybe we'll, we'll talk about it later when we talk about uh, translation. Yes, but uh, that was wonderful. I mean, so inspiring and it's so beautiful, you know, and I just want to add to what you were saying, you know, this is just uh, somebody, a friend of mine from France uh, itself, just uh, asked me to write a poem on this great uh, uh, monument or the sculpture built by this postman. I'm forgetting the name of the place and the artist. But when you were talking about the sculptures who inspired you, I just remembered it. The Palais des Muse, something. I, I'm just forgetting. Do you remember, do you know uh, the palace uh, which has been built by a um, former postman just collecting stones? Oh, yes, uh, the palace of uh, Factor Cheval. Uh, it's a very suggestive place, too. Yes, that's that's the same type of uh, of um, imagination, of, of work of imagination. You're right, quite. Right. That is a narrative poem, and someday I'll show you. But anyways, uh, that is amazing that you have been inspired by uh, artists, their past, and I love the way you were talking about memories and that ribbon, uh, which is endless, and we don't know where things begin and where they end. Thank you for that. That was amazing, and I think that you're right. We can right now talk about the translations, and then we talk about other things. So please uh, do tell us about the uh, translations that you have done, you know, at length, all the yeah. words. Um, I translated uh, mostly from English and uh, it all began because I was teaching and it was, this is the book I, I translated first because I met the poet um, and wanted to invite him to, my, to, to meet my students, but they were young students and didn't understand English. And I had heard uh, Barry Valenstein read his poems and tell them with music and I was completely sure it would be a great discovery for the kids because they were kids, they were uh, 12 or 13. And uh, so I just um, tried to translate his uh, poetry and that was really my first, <laughs> my first try. And uh, he was satisfied with, uh, with it. The kids were very pleased. We, still, we even uh, made uh, a show with his poetry we called it the blue note because uh, he is a jazz fervent and uh, reads with uh, jazz uh, musicians. And um, well, we decided that uh, we would publish the book. It had a first publication uh, with a publisher who disappeared. And uh, time passing, uh, I met another publisher here in Nice where I live, uh, who is the person who allowed me to publish in Italian too. And uh, we decided to make a book, a booklet, because they are very small books and I love what he does because they are economic books. Um, this one is 10 euros. It's not expensive in France. It's um, really one of the first, <laughs> the smallest prices for books. And uh, I met um, a wonderful artist who was making incisions and uh, she was working with blue wings. And I thought, well, my, it's exactly what I need. And uh, she accepted to give us wonderful images who oh, accompanied yeah. this uh, story because this too is a story. Uh, Tony's Blues, it's called, and Tony's Blues is the story of um, a strange character uh, 
completely in and out of society with uh, strange reactions. It was very, very interesting uh, working with it because it's quite different from my own imagination. But um, anyhow, it's, uh, it's, it was very interesting to, to do even for that because I just learned how to deal with other mental organization. I also translated uh, Australian parts for the magazine I was working with and I now direct. And um, well, mostly women, I should say. And I'm glad I did it. Uh, um, Jan Owen, uh, Judith Rodriguez, I translated one wonderful writer who died, uh, who was uh, Martin Harrison. And uh, what made me translate them is the fact that it was uh, every, every, each time it was a very interesting poet working on the structure of uh, poetry. And uh, not, um, it was, the pleasure was that the difficulty to deal with them. Not, uh, it, it was more interesting than something near me, I should say. Um, the last book I translated, I forgot to take it, is uh, Soleil Hésitant. It is from the uh, Israeli poet Gili Aimovich was a great traveler, was um, an internationally known poet, and she comes to set too. I will be happy to meet her there and welcome her. And uh, Soleil Hésitant is uh, uh, the, the biggest <laughs> undertaking I had in poetry. It's a big book, more than 100 uh, poems. And very interesting because she's an interesting poet, a paradoxical character with lots of, uh, uh, how should I say, lots of uh, insights in uh, her life uh, about body, about femininity, about maternity, all things I discovered with her, how poetry can speak of one's own self without um, poetical uh, words, with uh, everyday words and a great insight and a great attention to uh, the how to say the metaphors and uh, the sense uh, the the signification of the words. Uh, it's a really great uh, poet. Uh, and after all this uh, poetry, I must say that um, what what interests me really uh, <laughs> is the fact that when translating, I just feel like diving inside another poet's soul. It's very strange. It's a sensation I'm looking for. I had it for the first time while I translated Barry. Um, I was listening to his uh, voice, reading the poems and writing them because I had no uh, written version. And why I, while listening to him and trying to see what, uh, to think what I should say with French words, I just had the impression but it was really very strange to be inside his head thinking with his words uh, and uh, being myself with his words in his head a very strange uh, psychotic sensation but it was so interesting that uh, that's I re what i'm really looking for when i translate this way of um, opening parts of uh, uh, others inner words and assimilating them in a way. Hope you're having had the, the right spot for the transmission. I think I, I don't hear you anymore, Pankori. Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful, great. I don't know if I'm visible or not because I am yes, already in my balcony looking for the signal. I don't. Yeah, you are. So, uh, ma'am, you know, thank you for that. That was okay. Great, great. So um, that was an amazing answer. Thank you so much. Um, I have so many questions that I'm uh, simply moving on to the next one, which is about your favorite poets. 
uh, in past and present, and even writers? Okay. Uh, before I answer, I will tell you the strange sensation of seeing you walking to get the connection. You just make me think of um, uh, <laughs> something strange like uh, um, a legendary person, uh, a person in a, in a film, in a myth, uh, trying to access some, <laughs> some secret place. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. So, um, you just asked me a few minutes ago, what were my favorite parts? And I was uh, ashamed at the idea that uh, I couldn't cite that many favorite women poets. Uh, and I reflected that um, the major poets are those who were presented to me as a child and uh, when I studied, but I imagine it's not very much different now. Uh, when I studied, you studied um, male poets. Uh, the story, literary story, is made of male figures, uh, not women. And uh, so that um, I have in mind immediately Guillaume Apollinaire, who's not really a great uh, female supporter, but uh, to me the greatest poet ever, because when I read him, uh, I had the sensation that I I had really something to write to. That's the, the poet who uh, introduced me to poetry. Um, of course, I met others since then. Uh, if I try to think of the oldest one I love in uh, Italian, for example, I have Tassos, um, the author of Jerusalem Liberata. Uh, I love him because it's very musical. And I think that just like Apollinaire, I'm in love with poetry when it's music to me. And when I write, I, I say my poetry. I can't write without saying words and trying to, but not only saying, I just sing them. It's a sing song. It's not really a song. I'm not a singer, but uh, to, to me, it's singing my poetry. And so does the Tasso and um, so does Apollinaire to me. That's why I'm very fond of them. Just as I'm fond of uh, uh, English romantic poets, Keats is very musical and uh, his images are beautiful and I love him and I love reading him. And I love uh, Coleridge, for example, the rhyme of the old mariner, which is a narrative poem. Uh, is very suggestive uh, and uh, well I very later <laughs> I discovered a, a major female poet which is uh, who is uh, Marceline Desbord Valmore she's not known outside France uh, and she's not even very much known in France uh, and yet uh, she discovered ways of writing poetry which were um, before Lamartine and before Verlaine who appreciated her very much, but she was quite, um, even if her poetry is still sung by actual singers, because it's very musical, it's beautiful, uh, she's not known as a poet herself. Um, I like, uh, as I thought of another poet I discovered later on, who's uh, Lucie de la Rue Mardru. She's quite unknown, and yet she's one of the best um, poet of the beginning of the 20s in France. She was an explorer too. She was married to Charles Madre who translated uh, the, um, the Thousand Nights uh, uh, in French. And uh, she's very original. Uh, she's deep in her writing and yet completely unknown uh, except for intellectual and uh, university um, circles. You are now in a complete dark. It's very, very impressive. <laughs> so I go on with um, the poets I read. I have um, in my, near the bed, always at hand, uh, Sylvia Plath, who's another woman writer, was very much uh, interesting to me because she goes deep in uh, in feelings and she her writing is very original. I read, um, I often read Eugenio Montale for the English, Roberto Raros for the South America, 
or in France, uh, Philippe Jacoté, who disappeared f uh, s some time ago. Um, but I do love reading contemporary word poetry. We receive a lot of poems. We discovered a lot of poets uh, with the magazine I'm in charge of. And uh, it's very interesting to me because it uh, nourishes me with other words, other critters and um, things to translate, which is important for a poet to do. Did I answer to your question, Pankuri? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. I don't know if... Uh, can you hear me okay now? Yes, I can hear you. I have been... I have been walking around in the whole house, uh, just looking for the signal. I don't know. Uh, today is exceptionally, you know, uh, a trying day, signal wise. Yeah. But it's so it nice happens. to hear you, and thank you for all. I and I'm going to look up into uh, so many of these poets that you've talked about. So thank you, ma'am. I wish to ask you about the popular themes in contemporary French poetry and writing. Today. Some themes that you think are very popular with people or are fashionable or something that kind of influences. Are there such themes? Oh, if I have to talk about um, contemporary poetry really nowadays, I should say there are really a wide panel of uh, inspiration and size. You still even if there are no schools anymore, just as there were with surrealism or others, um, you still have poets who are inspired by um, images and uh, uh, a type of writing like um, the surrealism did with uh, vivid imagery. Uh, you have uh, as well a Norfolk vein and a, a mystical way of considering poetry as a, a way to enter uh, the mysteries of life, just as um, the romantic uh, German poetry. Um, you have poets who are closer to experimentalism and uh, um, who write uh, uh, trying to um, expose uh, structure and language. Uh, uh, but for myself, I should say that the mainstream, which interests me and which is uh, emergent now, um, seems to be um, poetry conscious of uh, the world's conditions. There has been um, poet workers. We uh, published some of them on the last issue, the precedent issue of the review. Uh, poets um, writing about the banality of life and work. Um, now, I think that nowadays, really, in these days, uh, we can't speak of um, engagement just as um, could be spoken when uh, there was a wartime with René Char or with political um, intentions such as Louis Aragon and the Communist Party. But there are poets engaged um, in uh, people's lives and uh, difficult situations. And I would mention um, the last book um, published by always my small editor, my small publisher, whom I love very much because he's very courageous. And this book is uh, Eldorado Lampedusa. It's been written by Estelle Fenzi, who was a French poet, a good French poet. And uh, it, this book is written in uh, French, in Arabic, and in Italian. Why? Because Estelle just uh, was shocked by the situation of the boot people uh, who arrived from uh, the north of Africa to uh, the south of Italy in an island called Lampedusa and who arrived with their dreams uh, of an Eden, of an Eldorado where they would have been happy and have fine work and have uh, restored family conditions. and. All is fake. Nothing happens. Nothing good happens to them. They die on the on the road, or they're back to their countries. And uh, her poems, they are very short poems, but each of them just tickles where it hurts, 
because she really is interested in what people feel. Um, I think it's the real important poetry in France today, this one, this stream of poetry. And I love the idea that the publisher uh, accepted to have it in three languages, which is very courageous. My last book, Gilly's book, uh, was not published bilingual because the publisher said um, it doesn't sell. So there's only my translation and <laughs> it's offending from the English text and it's, uh, it's silly because it will never sell if you don't propose it. So that I'm happy to promote this book, which is trilingual, and uh, to promote uh, through it also the idea that translation is so important uh, between countries, between people, and that poetry, which is so difficult and so easy at one time to translate, because uh, it's very difficult to enter in somebody else's imagination, language, and so on. But when you feel what the other wanted to transmit as an emotion, um, aesthetical or um, emotional sensation, uh, it's it's rather easy because you, you can find in your own uh, structure uh, things to support this idea and to bring it to others. And I think this is, this bringing poetry to others is the real thing that matters to me. Absolutely, great. And what a beautiful way of putting it, wow. You said something very, very intriguing now. You said that uh, you were talking about this poetess uh, who you really liked, and you said that um, she writes uh, in, in a way which tickles where it hurts, right? Yeah. Yeah. So are these, are these uh, issues of, say, development, are these political issues? Uh, could you just uh, say, that, uh, say a, a little bit more about it? Because in contemporary Indian writing, you know, um, there are there are poems, uh, there are uh, stories, there are novels that talk about the state of the country, say the lack of development, or people's superstition, or the corruption of the parties, you know, the political parties and all well, that. Well, yes, yeah. Yeah. I guess there is, but um, I won't talk about it much because I think the as a part, uh, the most important thing to me is to write and not to have a political um, a, a political comment about the situation. Uh, writing just as Estelle did about what people think is much more than a comment. It's acting for them, acting with them. Uh, I wrote things about um, expatriation. I wrote things about the difficulty of life, but uh, it wasn't a comment about the the situation or the political or the governmental uh, attitude. It was just, um, what do you call it? I just uh, put things as they are and just ask people to look at it and have their own opinion. That's what poetry should do, what art should do. Put things under the eyes of people so that they can't say, I didn't know. If you comment, they can always say, well, my opinion is, the, is, the, is another one. If you put things under their eyes, they can't escape. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I think that you have kind of anticipated my next question, but I still am going to ask this about the relationship between French art and uh, the commenting on French politics, uh, you know. <laughs> I think yeah, uh, you, you've already answered it, but I still kind of, um, you know, uh, wish to ask you that uh, because um, if there is, say, a big corruption scandal going on, uh, do you think that poets might um, choose to, you know, indirectly write a satire or something mm -hmm. like that? They uh, should. They should act um, as citizen. But as a poet, it's no, it's, well, it's not uh, pertinent. As a citizen, I act, I vote, I decide, I comment. As a poet, I act differently. Eventually, if my being a citizen as a well-known person, person 
can uh, have much weight. Yes, it's important. But these are two separate things to me, the citizen and the poet. To me, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. No, 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 not at all. You're not wrong at all. You have a very valid point. And there is a fear of poetry turning into a very rhetorical sort of political commentary. And that, that is happening too much in my country as well. Uh, but having said that, uh, if you allow me, I, I, I want to say, say the devil's advocate and just cite a few examples like, you know, of Hemingway and so many other people. Uh, who during the Spanish Civil War were very yeah. vocal, you know, about the involvement. So what do you have to say about that? Well, that's not only about political um, or governmental situations, it's about people. You may act, you may, uh, I think of Picasso and Guernica, it was acting. It didn't discuss the thing, it just showed it and made yeah. it, uh, impactful for people and i react as a poet not as a writer because writing novels writing essays is another thing as a poet i think it's just like um like what picasso did with with painting with art you show people what what's the situation what's happening what are people living in or uh, fighting against but comment is useless it just doesn't add anything Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I wish to ask you a little bit more about, uh, you know, the pandemic, the lockdown. You were active even at that point in time when you say that, you know, there should be this political distance, but you were active, you know, both socially and artistically. Do you want to share something about that time? Yeah, we had uh, three lockdowns, and um, during the first one, I was um, I was very much down. <laughs> the lockdown made me down. I uh, couldn't write, couldn't uh, couldn't do much. But uh, was uh, very depressed because we didn't have our monthly meetings in Nice anymore. And uh, I spent a lot of time on Facebook and realized that um, with uh, this system, just like mainstream or Zoom, we could meet people, and that Facebook was spots where to meet people and do something poetical too so that um that, that was during the first um the first lockdown that uh, uh, we with the friends i have for our monthly meetings jeudi des mots thursday of the words uh, we proposed to people to send us short poems haikus uh, putting photos on Facebook and we got lots of answers really we were submerged by poets, uh, poetry uh, so that at the end of the lockdown we read these poems during our new um, physical session and uh, everybody was very happy we had lots of people we had lots of readers and we really re realized that um, um, all these systems were important too to maintain a link so that with the second lockdown uh, we decided to have uh, a theme and we asked people to send us poems uh, on the theme of desires all desire not only a physical uh, sexual desire but uh, desire of liberty freedom and so on uh, it was the theme of the printemps des poètes which is a big um, moment in uh, March in France and we got many 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 poems and photos lots of things too and we decided to make um, a small anthology with it always with my friend publisher Pourquoi viens tu cita? why did you come so late is the name of his publishing house so we made this anthology and uh, then we made a um, homage to Baudelaire too, uh, where you were a member too, you read something too for us uh, on uh, Baudelaire. And uh, with um, Recours au Poème, the magazine I'm uh, in charge of with Carole Mesrobian, uh, we decided to make um, uh, 24 hours of poetry around the world. 
and we had lots of um, people wanted to to be part of this uh, uh, this relay too. Uh, it was um, very interesting to to think that we were at the core of uh, um, a way to. Well, it doesn't it doesn't really make for the physical encounters, but I discovered that we had the possibility to contact people very far from France. I would not have known you without such uh, intercourses <laughs> on the web. Uh, so, well, we tried to uh, to make poetry vital, just as it must be uh, vital, because it helps people to uh, get away, to get elsewhere. And it helps people because it uh, gives them the opportunity of creating something, making something of themselves. That's what I learned with this pandemics, which I hope finishes because it's still very, very long. Right, right. And what a lovely way of putting it. And uh, I want to thank you and congratulate you for having utilized the tough time so beautifully. And I hope that the pandemic is going to be over. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear. I hope not, not that well. Okay. Um, so I was just saying that, you know, uh, thank you and congratulations for uh, handling the lockdown and the pandemic and all that time so meaningfully and so beautifully. Thank you so much. And I think that let us read the translations, you know. I've had to come in front of my laptop and put because that is where they are. So if you allow me, I want to read the first poem I did of yours. It's called September. Okay. September is the first mm -hmm. part of, um, of a poem which I wrote from my traveling along the south coast of France. Uh, because I'm living in Nice and I worked in Winton and every day I had to travel forth and back. And every day I, the, the train stopped in a small station from which I saw a rooflet. And I wrote about this rooflet in two occasions, September and later on. Wonderful. That I actually meant to ask you about the rooflet. You know, it is a poem that I'm translating, and it just talks about this view. And there is this expression of umbrella pine. <laughs> do you do you have? Uh, it's the French word parasol. It's the name it has because uh, it's uh, crouching and it makes just like some sort of umbrella. It's very <laughs> it's very cozy when it's warm. Right. Is this a kind of a pine tree or is it something? Yeah, like it's a pine tree. You can find it on the coast, on the Mediterranean coast. I will send right. you a photo. Thank, Thank you. And I'm really enjoying uh, translating it as I did uh, enjoy these ones. So I think that I will just go ahead and read September now. And I really identified with this because, ma'am, you're not going to believe that since the last third of March, we have actually been locked down in this house of mine in the native place. So almost for one year. I mean, I can count on my fingers how many times I have exited the house for little, little things, you know, just for little things, short distances, small distances not even a one long walk so my only walk happens on my roof net, on the rooftop on the terrace so i really identified with this uh, i think i will go ahead and read it i hope you can hear me yeah i can okay great thank you i apologize for the signal i really do and i hope that we will again connect in a better time from delhi where the signal will be better. This is the state of affairs in India. September. Kitni na kafi sabit hoti hai ya choti si chhat bilkul puri nahi. Gayab hoti hui khubsurat aramdeh shaakhon ke piche chipi hui adhikadhik roshni mein jo kehti hai aap se mich michani ko apni aak hai 
समुद्र के आने के आगे जहाँ गायब हो जाता है सब कुछ हजार प्रतिबिंबों में कोशिश करती हूँ पकड़ने के लिए छूटता बचता है वह मौसम के जहाज सा क्या पहुंच पाएगा वह अंत तक खुले समुद्र तक Right, so it's strange hearing it in another language. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Pankuri. It's a great experience. Thank you so much. Do you want me to read it in French? Yes, yes, please. Um, I think you read September and November. Did you? I can't hear you. I have a translation. Okay, please go ahead. Just read the French, uh, the French original. I read the English and then the original. The English for my friends who don't understand French. But I don't know if you read only September or September and November. Well, I will read both because it's yes. not very long. Yeah. First in English, then. September, the rooflet fails me, disappearing behind luxurious boughs, hidden in the excessive light, which as you blink at the mirror of the sea, where all vanishes in a thousand reflections. As I vainly try to seize it, it escapes as much as the weather ship did she finally get to the open sea? December, at the flea market, from an antique dealer's stall, a small zinc ship waves to me so small on its iron pole, so miserably far from me in and sea. Could it be? Could some gush of wind have finally torn it away from the rooflet and abandoned its relic amongst other time-worn things? Am I the one that's expected? And now in French. Septembre. Toiton me fait défaut. Derrière l'opulente frondaison, happé par l'excès de lumière qui fait cligner les yeux au miroir de la mer sur laquelle tout se réfléchit et se perd, je tente en vain de le saisir. Il m'échappe autant que le virevoltant navire. A-t-il enfin rejoint le large Décembre. Sur l'étal d'un brocanteur, un bateau de zin me fait signe. Qu'il est petit, empenné sur sa flèche de fer, misérablement loin de la mer et du vent. Est-ce lui, arraché à toiton par quelques bourrasques, échoué dans le vétuste bric-à-brac, sous le froid soleil du matin qui givre la laine et les doigts, est-ce moi qui l'attend Thank you. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, I can. Okay, great. I will just read this for December. Oh, so I read the second hand cheese. Sorry? I said I've already read it, so you finish with you end with it. I I read both. Oh. September and December. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. So I will read the Hindi version. Yeah. Purani second hand cheese on ke bazaar me, puratan prachin tam cheese on ke vyapari ki dukan se, jaste ka ek chota sa jahaz, milata hai abhivadan mehar, 
मुझे देखकर इतना छोटा लोहे के अपने खंबे पर टिका समुद्र और हवा के साथ एक दयनीय दूरी में जीता क्या यह संभव है क्या यह संभव है कि हवा के तेज झोंके ने अलग कर दिया उसके बसेरे से उसे और ला फेंका यहाँ दूसरी पुरानी चीजों के साथ क्या मैं ही हूं वह जिसकी उसे प्रतीक्षा है ब्यूटिफुल थैंक यू पंकर ब्यूटिफुल लैंग्वेज यूर्स I love it. It sounds so. It sounds very sweet. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a a great gift. Thank you, ma'am. My pleasure and honor. Thank you. Uh, now, do you want to, uh, you know, treat me to to the reading of this one, the girl with the big eyes? Well, yes, with great pleasure, because it has been translated by a friend of mine, Bernard Toulle. And because we published it on uh, the, our magazine, and uh, it's a great honor having your poems on it, uh, Pankuri. They're wonderful too. So you read it, and I read it in French after you. Okay, great. The girl with the big eyes hurts, really hurts, plainly and simply hurts, darkly and deeply hurts, the deep within. or even on the surface easily visible everybody was wanting the pleasure of the kill was secretly harboring it hiding it in some crevice inside which ultimately the girl will fit and fall she will simply lose it big be dead or some place close to it it will all be over for her the years of baby making and she will be left barren she will be left with nothing the girl with big staring eyes the girl with big empty eyes they all knew it and kept it hidden like the pleasure of the kill disguised in being right like the pleasure of the kill for those who would never live a gun or a knife or a hammer just do it plotting inspiring forever presenting her with a wrong turn for her to see and walk a creature of free spirits to look to be muse to ponder to peruse with a big empty eyes wakened now totally devoid of the pleasure of kill with everybody else his eyes it's a very dark poem about gender discrimination in far for situation it's just an illustration of what i i think this poem puts things under the eyes of a reader you don't make comment you just put things and it's so moving it's terrific thank you so much pankuri uh, may i read it in french thank you yes ma'am such an honor La fille aux grands yeux fait mal fait très mal tout simplement tout platement mal sombrement infiniment mal qu'au fin fond de même voir à la surface à la vue de tous tous brûlés de l'envie de tuer entretenait en secret dissimulé dans une fissure enfouie Le vœu que la fille trébuche, chute, perd de gros, soit morte ou pas loin, finit pour elle ses années de fertilité, elle sera stérile, perdra tout. La fille aux grands yeux, au regard fixe, la fille aux grands regards creux, il le savait tous, le dissimulait, comme le goût du sang, camouflé aux rectitudes, comme le goût du sang. de ceux qui jamais ne tiendraient un fusil, un couteau, un marteau, mais conspirent, complotent. Ils lui suggéraient toujours la mauvaise question, le mauvais choix, la mauvaise note sur laquelle s'engager, aller voir, esprit libre, aller vérifier, dérouter, cogiter, scruter, avec ses grands yeux vides, vitreux désormais, totalement exempts du goût du sang, présent dans le regard 
de tous les autres. It makes me creepy. <laughs> It's terrific. Such an honor. I can't tell you what a moment this is for me. I'm just overwhelmed and overjoyed. Thank you. I'm very happy to. This is a great meeting, a great moment for me. Thank you, Pankuri. I hope we we'll make some other things with you in France next time. Thank you so Thank much you. also to our listeners, if there are. Thank you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. There are friends and they are sending all greetings to you as well. Actually, one of your friends is also here. Carol uh, sends you greetings and my friends. Actually, one from Israel, one from Israel. Many others, I'm sure. But the signal is really bad. So I think I'm going to take time to reach them all. But there are many friends and they will... Uh, slowly send you more messages and more, uh, you know, greetings. But uh, and they're going to love the show because we here really admire French poetry. You know, we are uh, really so very fond of. And I also had the opportunity of translating one poem by Baudelaire and uh, others. So my friend from France, whom uh, who have texted, has also joined. He lives in France and translates. French poets. He's translated some classic poets uh, from um, French, directly from okay. French. Yeah, and there are other friends as well. Somebody has joined from Trinidad, my friend from Trinidad. Anne Marie says hello. She says, excellent interview. Somebody from Bangladesh, my friend Al Mamun Abdullah, says uh, uh, lots of love to both of you. Uh, so there are lots and lots of friends sending you greetings. K. Kumar Prasanna, very nice poet from the southern part of India, uh, whose mother tongue is different. Uh, his mother tongue is Telugu. He's saying amazing. And he says, um, he sends you greetings. Then he says, such a knowledgeable personality, such a learned scholar. Um, so, And this friend of mine has actually written a message in French, so I can't read it. But I think he's saying he's saying thank you and something else, uh, some very nice conversations. And I can translate mercy. So <laughs> I can I, I know thank you, but that's about it. Otherwise I have to trans Google Translate and read. So there are many, many people. I'm so happy. My friend Parmeshwar Das, Isaac Cohen from Israel. I'm so happy that these people all enjoyed it. So thank you again, Ma. Uh, thank you God. again. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for this link. Really, it's a great thing linking people for poetry. Thank you, Pankori. Thank you, ma'am. Our pleasure and honor. We hope that we can do more such things, both online and in, in India as well. Thank oh, you. yes, that would be great. Thank you, Pankori, and goodbye. I guess Thank you leave the you leave the studio. I don't know how to, to shut the yes. things. Yes, thank you. Good night, friends. Good night, Pankari. See you soon, I hope. See you, ma'am. <laughs>